Good evening, Menlo Atherton community. Uh, I am Simone Kennel, principal. We are going to give just a minute for our families to sign on here and we will get started. Welcome to our webinar this evening. De nuevo, esta presentación estará disponible en español. Si desea escuchar en español, por favor, haga clic en el botón que dice interpretación. So welcome to our webinar this evening. Uh, we are going to introduce the panelists who are here. Uh, and so I'll start again uh, in case you're just signing on. I'm Simone Kennel. I'm the proud principal of Menlo Atherton High School. And then we will go through introductions for um, our administration team, our board members and our superintendent and our athletic director. So why don't we go in that order? Administration team, go for it. Sure, I'm uh, Carl Lusco, the Instructional Vice Principal. Uh, Emily Rigatti, I'm one of the Administrative Vice Principals. I'm Nick Muse, uh, another of the Administrative Vice Principals. I am Stephen Emmy, one of the Administrative Vice Principals. And I will, I'm happy to introduce, uh, unless I, I missed it, uh, Paul Snow, our co-athletic director. Paul, you wanna say hi? Hi, sorry, I didn't know which order. Um, I'm Paul Snow, one of the two ADs at MA is my 16th year at MA and 10th as the AD. And then we are fortunate to have interim superintendent, uh, Crystal Leach with us this evening and board president, Alan Weiner, vice president, Alan Sarver, and trustee Chris Thompson joining us on the panel. Uh, we're going to get started a couple of housekeeping items. We ask that you do not type questions yet until we get to the question and answer session. Some of your questions will likely be answered uh, within the context of the presentation. Uh, we will go through the presentation and then we, our aim is to have 15 minutes uh, for moderated questions and answers. Uh, at the end of the webinar. Uh, we also, um, there was one other announcement. Oh yeah, I think I made the announcement about the questions. Uh, and so we are going to get started. Uh, so uh, I, welcome, I welcome everybody this evening. And again, I wanna thank um, uh, Superintendent Crystal Leach and our board president, Alan Weiner, Vice President Alan Sarver and trustee Chris Thompson for joining my wonderful staff and administration team. Uh, Emily, Carl, Nick, Stephen and Paul Snow, our co-athletic director. This team has been amazing. They are here every day. They are on the front lines of making um, this very interesting situation work every day. So this week, as I was walking out of the grocery store, I actually ran into a longtime family friend, also a retired superintendent, who asked me how I was doing and said he thinks about me every day as he works with superintendents and school leaders to help craft plans for any reopening. He said the challenges are nothing like he's seen for any school leader, for teachers, for staff, for students and families. While I knew that, it felt good to hear that from somebody who spent many years leading schools and districts under typical circumstances. So I'm here to tell you this evening, the challenges that our students, teachers, staff, and you, our families are facing are like nothing we've seen. This is a design thinking project. There's not a design or road, road map for no matter how much brainstorming we do. How do we possibly provide quality education in the virtual world, which I think we've accomplished, and balance safety concerns with a virus that could have dire consequences for our staff, our students, and our families? It's a very hard choice. So this evening, I hope you will listen and hear what we've done to navigate these choices 
and all the considerations underway for any reopening for our school and our district. So with that, I thank you in advance. Uh, and I'll just say, uh, students, if you're here listening this evening, I want you to know this is all about you. It's about you, it's about your teachers, and it's about the best experience we can provide for you under these uh, circumstances. And that is front and center on everybody's minds here. Okay, so we will get into our presentation. We can go to the next slide. So uh, we're in distance learning. Uh, you know the parameters now, our students and teachers have been living it. Um, doing amazing work and amazing job uh, getting instruction virtually. Um, we've increased internet access for sure, um, and we'll have some free public county Wi-Fi as of this week. Um, we're going to highlight for you the academic social emotional supports. Um, we do have a quarter one distance learning survey out. We would love more responses. Um, we have heard from families that um, they are uh, generally happy with the distance learning, the instructional program. Wednesday attendance, we need to work on that as a school and district um, and look at social opportunities for students. So, so those are some of the trends we've heard so far. And then this evening, we're gonna tell you about phasing in cohorts. Very quickly, I'm gonna ask Nick and Emily to share some examples of what we're seeing in the virtual classroom. Thank you, Simone. Um, as a, uh, um, granted the pleasure of being in our teachers' very rich uh, virtual learning environments that they've created for our students. Uh, we've all noticed uh, wonderful examples of, of rich instruction using the tools available to them to create um, incredible experiences. One that I witnessed was uh, was in Rachel Andres' geometry class where she used Pear Deck to create um, really robust discussions among students uh, about uh, about the, the topic at hand. Um, she was able to monitor students as they worked and, and intervene really effectively. And it was a, a class that, that I would want my own daughter to be a part of. Great, and I get to talk about um, a Socratic seminar practice that Ms. Olson is doing in her, one of her um, history classrooms. Um, it's a practice she's doing every Thursday it involves students working together um, as a full class, having dynamic discussions and debates. Um, they even have accountability partners where they get to secretly message each other um, and encourage each other. And when one team speaks, all cameras are on. And when one team doesn't speak, all cameras are off for that team. So it's a really interesting way to hold a Socratic seminar and an academic rigorous discussion online, which is really exciting to see. And- well, oh. Sorry. No, go ahead, Simone. <laughs> I was just going to add one. I saw a wonderful in Ms. Walls Apes class, a soil science lab that students were able to do at home. So um, we're seeing some of those exciting things. And now I'm turning it over to Emily for the next part to tell you about our uh, access cohorts and co-curricular cohorts at MA. Great, thank you. All right, so we have been very hard at work. This is like building the airplane as you fly it. Um, to create internet access for our um, students who need that. Um, so we currently have, this is just to give an update, we currently have four internet access cohorts on campus. Um, they um, hold up to 12 students in a cohort and they are supervised by substitutes and voluntary staff. So um, a huge, huge thank you to our substitutes who are here every day. Um, we have counselors who are rotating in to help out. Um, we also had a few campus aides rotate in to help out. Um, so we're really, really lucky to have um, that push behind these um, academic co or access cohorts. You can see um, our students in the PAC and the makerspace um, six feet apart with plexiglass. They have their masks on, they are working on their computers and um, they get lunch every day. Um, and we're really um, fortunate to have the man or woman or person power behind them to be able to make it work. Um, we do do temp checks every day and health screening upon entry and obviously are reinforcing the COVID-19 rules. And there's a contract that everybody has to sign understanding um, that they have to follow those rules. 
Um, for these particular cohorts, we targeted students who were failing multiple classes, seniors, those that have poor internet, um, and especially our homeless and foster youth who are in need of a safe space to work. Next slide. We also have going on on campus some after school cohorts. Um, I did see through our parent survey that there were questions around whether or not these were happening and what was going on with athletic cohorts. So we want you to know that there are 34 athletic cohorts happening on campus. There are two study groups affiliated with two of the cohorts. Um, the um, groups um, doing athletic conditioning are football, water polo, cross country, cheer and dance. Um, and then this week we did start co-curricular cohorts, which are um, ap during the after school hours. Um, there are three currently right now focused on SPED um, students with IEPs, and then three more starting after Thanksgiving. And then um, the co-curricular cohorts are based on teacher availability. So they are after synchronous um, instructional time. They're capped at 12 students like our internet cohorts. Um, and we're looking to start um, some elective cohorts after Thanksgiving. We know that there's a huge need for um, that interaction on campus. And so that is one of our priorities. Um, and again, we're being cautious given cases rising in the community. Um, that's something that we're trying to be balanced as we know the need is really high, but we also wanna keep everybody safe. And now, oh, and I get to show you some more pictures. These were taken by um, one of our campus aides. Um, you can see what temp checks look like for athletic cohorts, um, what conditioning look like, looks like out on the football field. And then this is one of our um, after school um, cohorts um, that's in the G-Wing happening. And I believe up next is Mr. Muse. Thank you, Ms. Rigotti. Um, in addition to the, to the in-person cohorts, we are really, really fortunate to have um, a range of support, both academic and social and emotional um, for our students, um, powered by amazing educators who are making incredible things happen under very difficult conditions. Um, we have uh, two resources that we want to particularly highlight in terms of academic support, and those are teacher office hours, which are which are uh, on offer daily um, for students to connect with teachers one-on-one um, -on -one or in small groups to, to receive academic support. Um, we really, especially as we get closer to final exams, uh, want to encourage everyone to, uh, to take advantage of that. Um, we also have uh, homework center tutoring, peer tutoring, writing center on offer here. Um, we have the link directly to that, to, to those um, Zoom links that students can take advantage of, especially as they get closer to the end of the semester. Uh, as is the case when we have uh, bricks and mortar school, we have targeted support in the form of our many academic programs such as AVID, the Academy, SAP, and of course our ELD um, and academic resource programs offer continual support in case management um, and um, counselors are, are doing um, incredible work as well, um, supporting students and, and uh, guiding them through uh, this uh, very unique semester. We've also introduced um, a home visit team that has uh, been conducting home visits to students that we've had trouble connecting with um, using um, typical means. Um, so I think this, this week alone, we've had over 30 um, visits to, to homes in our communities, checking in with students, uh, getting to know their needs and, and connecting them to resources uh, as we are able. Um, we're also fortunate to have um, really powerful community partners um, in the Boys and Girls Club, 49ers Academy, who all, um, and Live in Peace, who all uh, monitor student participants and, and keep track of them and, and offer them a range of services as well. Um, we have a freshman transition program, which uh, is, is, is really doing uh, an amazing job getting students uh, in this virtual space to, to uh, become acclimated to MA and, and to navigate the um, the inherent difficulties of a freshman year in high school. Um, and as Emily discussed, we, we also are offering um, in-person co-curricular and academic supports, which are, which are underway and growing. Um, and we're, we're really happy to have those in place. Um, we've also added uh, athletic study cohorts where, where uh, student athletes uh, work together um, uh, apart from their athletic conditioning to, uh, to learn. Um, next slide, please. 
And we also have um, a range of, of mental health and social emotional supports as well. Um, our mental health landing page is linked here, but is also available on mabears.org. Um, we have, uh, as we as we reach the end of the semester, also uh, prioritized um, list of students that we are intensifying our outreach to as, as we get them to to pass classes and and make the most of the opportunities they have in front of them. Um, we have a ninth grade buddy system new this year, student led and student driven. I'm very happy to have have that. And um, as always. Um, Mr. Amoroso and his amazing leadership students have done a great job providing opportunities for students to connect with each other and, and continue to do the kind of community outreach um, that, that, uh, that they've done for so many years here, um, including Trick or Treat Street, Canned Food Drive, um, and earlier in the year, the Club Rush and uh, Fire Victim Relief Drive. Um, we also had a couple of virtual class rallies this week, and uh, we're, you know, we're happy to, to bring students together that way. Um, Andy Stewart and the Service Learning um, Center continue to look for ways for students to to contribute to their communities virtually um, and and safely in person when possible. And um, once again, uh, the co-curricular and in-person supports um, are are giving students a sense of connectedness um, in increasing numbers. And we also have some virtual clubs that are functioning, and we encourage students to reach out to those and and join. It's not too late. I'm going to pass this over to uh, A.D. Paul Snow at this point. He's going to tell you about athletics. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Muse. This is uh, Paul Snow. Again, I'm one of the athletic directors. We have two of us, and I am the lucky one to give you guys this information tonight. I wish I had more new news, but the uh, state, we've been waiting for three months very patiently for, for some new news, and, uh, and we were very eager to get it on Monday, and then the governor just sat through an hour and I think on the 55th minute, a reporter asked him about um, youth sports and he said, yeah, we're on pause now. So we're hoping this coming Monday we'll have more news, but uh, I can give you some old news and, sh and share just what, what's happening right now. Um, as mentioned in another slide, there are some teams. And in fact, there, there are more teams than, than were listed in that slide, like uh, girls lacrosse, uh, girls soccer has one Swimming has a couple, um, I said tennis, gosh, I'm missing one at least. Oh, volleyball, girls volleyball is, and boys volleyball hopefully soon, but we're clearing a coach now. So um, not all sports are um, conditioning, but a lot of them are. And uh, the cohorts we have, of course, are very limited because of COVID restrictions. Normally we have one coach to many more athletes than we're allowed now. Right now we're allowed only 15 to one. So one coach to 15 kids. Um, so that's what we are limited to right now. We are not allowed to have shared equipment and we're not allowed indoors yet. Um, we're working on that. We were getting close and then uh, things went for a turn for the worse. And so now we're back to just staying outside as we were before. So. Um, Important days for season one sports and all of this is on our website, which I listed in the second to last uh, bullet there. But uh, as of now, we are slated for December 14th. This is season one. This is different than every other year. This is, you know, COVID rules, but uh, it's just football and cross country, volleyball, both boys and girls, which is a change and um, cross country. So those are the ones that are participating and set to begin tryouts on December 14th, meaning your, your clearance packets have to be in a week prior, so 12-7. Um, I'm sure a lot of questions will pop up and you guys, um, I'm gonna stick around, you can ask them, but uh, you can also always get in touch with me via email, peacenote.seq.org, and I'm very good at getting back to you uh, quickly. So. By all means, if you don't wanna ask a question tonight, you wanna to type it out later, go for it. But we have a lot of general information on bearsathletics.com as well. That's it for me. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our interim superintendent, Ms. Crystal Leach. Good evening, uh, MA community and families. I am very uh, pleasured to be here with you tonight. So tonight I wanted 
um, just to share with you again, our commitment and goal uh, to gradually increase the number of students on campus through the, sing the spring semester. Um, and obviously we will do that within the health and safety parameters that the county provides us. And then also to make sure that we are keeping our staff and students safe. So we are working to offer an increase um, our academic, social, emotional development, mental health, and other student needs on campus. As you've uh, seen in some of the previous slides and further on in the presentation, uh, we will also be covering. Uh, last night at the board meeting, I did uh, provide a presentation um, on the most recent uh, COVID response plan. It is also, it's linked here as well as also available um, on our website. Next slide. So to, um, to talk to you about the plan that we are about to submit to the County Office of Education that would allow us to reopen under a different rule book than what we currently have. So back in March, uh, when we went into distance learning, which we are uh, referring to as phase one, we did not really have any supports. Um, we didn't, uh, we were 100% in distance learning. We didn't have any active cohorts um, on campus. Campus. We are currently in phase two, where there is primarily distance learning and then also um, a mixture of bubble cohorts. Now, bubble cohorts are quite restrictive. Um, the bubble cohorts, um, as mentioned earlier, can have up to 12 to 14 uh, students mixed with staff and they cannot intermingle with other cohorts. And that brings you know, a lot of um, still unmet needs from our students that may want or need to participate in different types of cohorts. So as we submit our reopening plan uh, to the county and when it's approved, we are allowed to then move towards stable cohorts as it becomes safe to do so. The stable cohorts allow us to expand the number of students and staff per cohort up to where we can keep the six foot socially distance requirement between us. Um, in addition to that, it also allows students and staff to be a part of different cohorts. We obviously try to limit the mixing of cohorts. That's the most safest way forward. But within phase three and with an approved reopening plan, we are allowed to, to do that. Also a part of our plan will be phase four. And phase four is where we actually have an in-person learning model. And I don't think we're covering, we're covering a little bit a high level talks about learning models tonight, but they are very complex. Um, it's important to maintain the integrity of the course that our students are in and provide the flexibility in case we actually have to return to 100% distance learning if there is a rise of cases, let's say within our MA community, within our school site. So it's important to uh, pick a learning model that allows that flexibility. So the plan primarily deals uh, with the health and safety standards. So the plan details um, on the side of this slide cover the cleaning and disinfection, cohorting, the interests and in egresses, face coverings, and, and so forth that you can see listed. Um, what's important is we've been practicing this. We have been practicing this since we started our athletic conditioning um, over the summer. And then when we were hopeful to have some type of return to the fall. So now we just have to scale up as we look at increasing um, the numbers of students that we have on campus. So uh, next is the rock star IVP, Mr. Loosecoat, I'd like to um, introduce. All right, thank you, Ms. Leach. Um, so as we um, start to implement that plan and bring kids into a stage, a phase three stable cohort model, what we wanted to do was kind of summarize uh, the major topics, and we're going to go into more detail in a minute, but summarize the major topics that we have been working on and are continuing to work on 
um, but this is everything we need to get into, play, into place. So one is, is facility considerations. Um, what's the, do, what are all of our rooms, do they have appropriate airflow to hold students, students and teachers in the room? Uh, we need to create a safe plan for students and staff that is agreed upon by administration, staff, parents, and students. And that involves many of the safety precautions that will be outlined in our plan, entrance and egress on and off campus, health screenings, cleaning and disinfection, pra disinfection practices, um, in between periods, at the end of the day, um, before school starts, and general movement on campus. And then, and then screening uh, of students and staff as they come onto campus, as well as testing procedures uh, we need to get into place. Um, part of one of the topics we need is gathering information from teachers and families. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the survey that's gonna go out to parents starting tomorrow, and we will ask you to complete. And all of that is um, information that's going to inform um, the instructional uh, process or instructional plan we develop. So we need to know from the survey how many students want to come onto campus. Um, that will inform a little bit um, whether we need to change schedules to create smaller class sizes. Um, we need to look at the locations of, of students where we're gonna house students on campus to minimize the mixing. Um, all of which kind of informs trying to create a flexible learning plan that, prot that protects instructional minutes for students that are coming onto campus, but also for students that are doing distance learning from home. Um, and that's the flexible part. So these are all of the topics we are working on and have been for some time. Um, so as we get into more detail, what I'm gonna do is introduce uh, Mr. Emmy so that he can talk about the facility and safety precautions. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, I want to begin by thanking um, the maintenance and operations staff who have worked really hard to support us in order to be able to be a, bring more students on campus. Um, and also our plant manager, Brian Oliver, and our custodians who have been instrumental in creating these safe spaces for our students to work in, who we would not be able to do this work without. Um, that being said, we are continuing um, our maintenance operations staff is continuing to modify our HVAC systems in our classrooms. Um, the CDC has released guidelines on what necessary um, qualifications have to be in place in order to host uh, students and staff safely within the uh, classrooms. Um, they are working tirelessly and we have a projection that by January 2021, um, we will have the rooms listed below available to use um, for cohorts, et cetera. Um, and we will continue to do that. We can do the next slide. Um, part of our preparation for anticipating increased numbers of students on campus is rearranging rooms. Um, some of our rooms vary in size. Um, so depending on the size of the classroom, we can have between eight to 14 students safely in the rooms socially distancing them all by six feet. Um, again, like you saw in the earlier pictures of our uh, access cohorts, students are at desks with plexiglass screens and required to wear a mask while inside. Uh, restrooms are assigned per cohort and students are only allowed to use um, the restroom one at a time. Um, again, our amazing custodial staff is on a strict schedule for disinfection of these areas, including routine disinfection of the bathrooms throughout the day, as well as cleaning every space that we have students or staff in at the end of every day. The next thing. Um, again, with anticipation of it having increased numbers of students on our campus, um, I've worked with um, our AVP secretary, Ofa Taimani, and Brian Oliver, our plant manager, to map out um, safe routes throughout the campus. <clears throat> In order to keep people socially distanced, we are going to be implementing one-way traffic in many of the hallways and two-way with stanchions and dividers in certain areas of the campus. Again, this is to maintain social distance. Um, we have decals on the floors, as you see. There are signs in the hallways. Um, so we are working hard in preparation for students' eventual return. Um, I do want to introduce Mr. Nick Muse again, who will talk about health screening. 
Thank you, Mr. Emmy. Um, for the students and staff coming onto campus, we have been since the beginning of the year um, been using um, health screening, the health screening protocol um, daily. As you can see pictured, um, we have students uh, complete uh, a QR code uh, health screening, including a temperature check. Um, here we have um, Mimi Menhivar, our, our wonderful um, front of office, um, helping with that along with our health aide, Tanya Edgington. Um, we also have all staff, we require all staff to complete um, an online health screening uh, survey before they, they enter campus with, with similar questions. And we monitor that list uh, daily to, to um, look at results and, and uh, highlight any, any trouble spots. Um, next slide, please. Um, we are also, the, the district is in discussions about uh, testing protocol for employees, regular testing protocols, and that is in progress. Um, and um, we have also, for all students and staff on campus, um, made sure that, that everyone is well aware of health protocols and, and social distancing um, requirements. Um, and every student who is on our campus right now um, has signed off on a contract um, indicating their agreement with, with all uh, of those requirements. Um, our, our kind of mantra throughout has been that keeping our campus safe is a shared responsibility. Um, we have a lot of helping hands on campus, but it requires all students and staff to, to fully commit to, um, to uh, following the, the protocols with fidelity. And we've, we really appreciate how, how folks have done that so far. Uh, Mr. Emmy, you want to talk about case protocols and, and if, if, we, if we hear of a positive case, what Yes. Happens? So um, we are following the county protocols um, for positive case reporting, um, as well as the district protocols. Um, when there are confirmed positive cases, we are reporting it to the county as district as well. Um, staff are notified because of HIPAA laws, we can't share this information wide, but if someone is a close contact, which means that they've been within six feet of the confirmed positive person for 15 minutes or longer, um, with a mask, without a mask, indoors, outdoors, then that person is considered a close contact and they're notified and, and requested to quarantine. Um, Otherwise, we will, as we increase numbers of students on campus, be sending general um, informational emails to our community if there are positive cases, of cases, of cases, but cases. But again, um, and just the fact that there were a pot, there was a positive case, we aren't allowed to give further information. Um, so far um, this year, we have had 25 reported MA staff and student COVID cases um, to date. And again, we want to stress all the. Um, all of them have occurred from interactions in the community. We haven't had any positive COVID cases on campus um, due to um, transmission on campus. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. We'll uh, turn it over to Mr. Loose Code again. All right, thank you guys. Um, can we have the next slide, Mimi? Okay, so the next topic that uh, we're addressing is that information gathering. And we've already um, had our certificated staff, our teachers complete two surveys. Uh, and now we need information from you, the parents and families. Uh, so tomorrow you will get a survey. Um, there'll be more information on the survey, but these are really the two um, most important questions. Right, question one, I would prefer that my student attend school for as many academic classes as possible that are offered in person. And question two, I would prefer that my student not attend school in person at all, but participate in coursework through 100% distance learning. So um, that's information that we desperately need and will help us um, make decisions about um, how we scale up some of the routines and practices we've already developed and uh, what type of learning model we can provide um, and also will inform scheduling decisions and class size decisions on campus. So please uh, look for it um, and respond uh, when you get it. It'll be open until December 4th, okay? And so again, all of that, um, the facility considerations, um, you saw that we had 62, we, we are planning to have 62 rooms available in January. So that obviously is gonna impact our ability to bring students on campus. Um, our goal is to maintain a quality rigorous instructional pro program. I think Ms. Kennel referenced survey data that um, many parents were 
felt good about the instructional quality that our students are receiving from our teachers. Um, and we, our priority in the spring semester is to maintain that, um, if not even improve upon what we're doing now. Uh, as we develop a new learning model um, that has some students on campus and some students at home, we wanna maintain the high quality of academic learning that has taken place for most students this year. Um, we wanna change teacher and student schedules as little as possible, um, absolutely. We do not um, anticipate collapsing a great number of classes, if any, I don't anticipate collapsing any, um, but I could see um, the need to move uh, some schedules around as we try to create um, reasonable class sizes. Um, if you're trying to fit 12 or 14 students in a classroom, um, that, that may require some adjustments. So we'll need your understanding if, if we come to that. Um, and obviously the entire goal is to reduce disruption to students and staff while maintaining that rigorous instructional program. So uh, we are in the process of developing this plan. Um, and the, the other goal is to consider the effectiveness, again, for the quality of instruction, both for students that would be in the classroom and for students that would be at home. We don't want to uh, sacrifice students that are learning from home uh, for the sake of students that are gonna be in the classroom and vice versa. So we want that to be high quality all the way around. And so finally, I think the last slide um, is, is really more of a summary is that all of the plans that we developed as we move into stage three, uh, as, we would, as we hope to move into stage three, we'll follow um, the guidelines laid out by the county, laid out by the state of California. Um, we will need to follow and pay attention to which tier we were in, tier we are in, and that will guide what we are able to do. In addition to being able to do um, all of these processes and plans with fidelity, we need to be able to do them well, and we need to be able to scale up so that we are able to serve a, a large group of students. And uh, that's what we're working on. And we look forward to um, rolling it out. I think we're, we'd, be, we'd be excited to bring students on campus. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Kennel who will talk about our communication plan moving forward. Thank you. Uh, so we have tools for communication. Um, I try and send uh, messages weekly or bi-monthly. Um, you get those in Bear Notes or School Messenger. If you're not subscribed to MAPTA Bear Notes, it's a great um, uh, newsletter to subscribe to. Our PTA volunteers do it strictly on a volunteer basis for us. Um, we also use School Messenger. Those go out typically on Fridays for any updates for the week. We thank everybody this week for encouraging students to take the interim comprehensive assessment on Wednesday. It also gave us a good way to see if attendance works better that way. Um, student email, Canvas, MA Today, we do still run. Mr. Giambruno uh, still has the students producing an MA Today show. And everything's available on our website. There are also updates from Superintendent Leach as well as uh, website updates on uh, that you can see all of the plans for the district on seq.org. All right, we can go to the next. Um, how can you help? Many, many parents have asked me this question and I have thought about it a lot. Um, right now, I think that I hope you have seen the rich resources we have at MA. So we clearly see a rise in cases. We're in the counties in the red. Um, we're definitely gonna be thoughtful about gradual, going slow to go fast to all the things we've just uh, spoken to you about as well as many considerations for the instructional model. So in the meantime, though, there are a lot of things families can do till we have kids back on campus. Please, please access the virtual supports that we have. I know being on Zooms all day is hard, but I have seen amazing things happen with these virtual supports, whether it's the peer tutoring, um, the writing centers, the social emotional check-ins, uh, service learning, clubs, tutoring, homework centers. Um, we're really fortunate because of you as our community, um, from the foundation to the PTA, to all of our parent groups and the district, to be able to offer all of these supports. So please, please take advantage of them or make a plan with your student. Um, we also continue to need substitute teachers to staff cohorts. And when we reopen, Depending on availability for staff, um, 
we will need supervision for class periods. That's an eventual reality once we get to that point. Um, and then we're gonna need more volunteers. Um, so you can see from the pictures the wonderful, amazing classified staff that we have here um, and administration staff are, are, are doing all of these things, right? The checks, the screenings. Um, and so we will need that. Um, and right now we really, really need everybody to get through the winter and holidays. Um, so uh, limit gatherings and travel for family. And I have a little bit more information on the next slide. Um, so please keep your holiday celebrations safe. Um, and if you do decide this is for everybody and I'll message it out to our community to travel during the holidays or attend gatherings where you might be at higher risk for exposure. We wanna make sure we continue to follow the protocols. I hope you can see from all the work we've been doing to do that and keep our community safe. Um, so in order to limit exposure, we would ask that uh, you self isolate for the quarantine period, which would be 10 school days um, after participating in any high risk activity. So this would include not participating in any on campus in person cohorts, right for academic support conditioning or co curricular during that 14 day time period. Um, and again, you can always check with your health professional uh, based on what what has occurred. Um, but we really, really are hoping everybody has an, a restful, safe um, holiday with the upcoming Thanksgiving uh, break. Uh, stay with your households, uh, Zoom gather, whatever it takes um, so that we can be, you know, we can continue to move, move ahead. All right, the next slide here. Again, we started this campaign in the summer. <laughs> Continue students, if you're here um, with your parents or parents, families. Um, I think we've gotten really good at this. We've seen that when the students come on campus, they are adhering to washing hands, wearing face coverings and distance. And now we just really, really need to add the plus, right? The non-essential travel and also avoid gathering outside immediate households. So just continue to remember, um, we all want this to happen uh, and be back in school. Okay, uh, so now we're actually amazingly on time with two minutes, two minutes early. Um, a couple of protocols for questions and answers. We will be moderating uh, questions. So if you could type your question in, um, I see some questions are coming in. Please be courteous. Um, we want to be able to answer your questions as best as we can. Um, Mr. Emmy and Mr. Muse will help moderate questions in both Spanish and English. And uh, Mr. Emmy will read questions out loud and direct a panelist to respond. And we will respond to as many questions we have time for. Um, so before we get, get to answering your questions, I just want to thank you, we all do, our MA community and our family, our teachers. I hope everybody can take a minute to write them a thank you or a commendation. Um, really want to thank everybody and uh, the staff here and, and our students. A teacher told me today that um, she is just amazed about how students are rising to the occasion, right? Um, and navigating all the ups, downs, sideways uh, with the virtual platform. So without further ado, we're going to the question and answer session. Thank you, Simone. Um, the first one is for interim superintendent, Crystal Beach. Um, when do we expect to hear back from the county on our submission? Um, after submission, um, according to the plan document, it takes them from 10 to 14 days. And then how does the governor's county designations impact the district's ability to open? So as of right now, um, the pause and the reversal back to red does not have um, an immediate impact on us. It will have an impact if the county of San Mateo does go back into purple. Um, what I find interesting today is the state um, curfews that have been implemented for counties that are currently in purple. Um, 
I think that that is preparing us for what may the future hold if our cases keep going up through the holidays. So I think that we will learn more, um, especially over the next two weeks and then the two weeks following um, Thanksgiving. Um, have we considered erecting tents to, to increase capacity for students? I can answer that yes. Um, we are thinking of that. The one hurdle we'll have to deal with is the rainy season and cold weather coming, um, but we do plan on maximizing the outdoor space as well. Um, Nick or Emily, how many total kids do we have on campus now? Uh, well, it's, it's hard to know exactly um, the number because it fluctuates from day to day, but we have four um, full-time cohorts during the day uh, with a maximum of 12 students. So um, we, as Emily alluded to earlier, attendance has been, has been an area for growth for us. Um, so on any given day, during the day, I would say we have uh, about 30 students um, on campus. Um, and in the afternoon, that number increases. And as far as uh, participation in athletic cohorts, I, I don't know um, the answer to that question. You probably better position answer that, Mr. Emmy, but, um, the, the number is small, but growing. Um, and I, I feel it, Mr. Snow can speak probably better to the number of uh, athletes on in cohorts in the evenings. Yeah, um, I think one of the slides said 34 cohort, cohorts. It might even be more than that now, but you times out by 15, you're at hundreds, over 500. Not on any given day by any means. They're all spread out throughout the week. Some some uh, cohorts are only once a week, and some are you know twice or three times a week, but they're all spread out and uh, not all in one spot at the uh, same time. Um, next question, when will clubs be allowed to meet in person? I don't know if Mr. Muse or Ms. Magadi wanna take that. Sure, um, so we're prioritizing academic support first for after school co-curriculars. Um, and then we'll move into clubs. I think the biggest thing for clubs is supervision. Um, and so we would need um, adult volunteers in order to do that. Um, quite frankly, our priority though as an AVP team and admin team is academic support first, um, given the highest need where we're at right now. Uh, next question is what is the general timing for stage three and um, what's the expected reopening date, assuming all goes well? So for stage three, um, if you would have asked me this on Monday, <laughs> um, stage three, I, I believe would be the middle towards the end of January. Um, it's, I think, going to all depend on what our cases look like within San Mateo County after the holidays. Um, we are not picking a date. Um, it's not really about a date. Uh, we obviously have our eye on the target of spring semester and as early as the health and safety um, of our facilities and what is best for our staff and students uh, to return them back to campus. Um, next question, what is the prerequisite for providing supervision? I can respond to that. So um, any for volunteers, they go through a clearance process. Um, our district has protocols for fingerprinting, especially if they're going to be working with students in any um, you know, direct capacity. And then, uh, so I think that was the question, right? For supervision. Uh, so there is a clearance process for volunteers. Um, and then for substitutes, there's a whole nother uh, process and requirements. Uh, to actually supervise students within a learning a learning space. Uh, next question is: Will there be a window to switch from one format of learning to the other, um, pending space? So distance learning versus hybrid. Yes, there will be. Um, when we get to the point of where we understand what the best model is for us to offer when we return. Um, another survey will be provided uh, to our families for them to choose what best works for their family. Um, how are stable cohorts possible? Do you have enough teachers who can do online 
and support on campus cohorts. Uh, that Carl, you're on, you're on mute, Carl. I, I can try to answer that. I think it's an excellent question. And I think that's um, part of why we need to gather the information from teachers uh, and from the number of students who want to come back on campus. Um, I think it's part of the process of working out with staff. Um, you know, how do we all agree on the safety precautions that we have in place? And what does the learning model look like? Uh, so I think it's a great question. It's one we're working towards. Um, you know, there's, there's models out there that, that have teachers in the class uh, providing um, instruction through Zoom to students in the class doing, you know, following that instruction on the Zoom account and students at home following instruction on Zoom account. That's just one model and that's one model we're looking at, but it's a great question and it's all part of the process of why we need to gather the information and um, discuss uh, the best model for moving forward. Um, next question is, if a student is participating in sports conditioning, but because of COVID, the sports season doesn't happen, will they receive PE credit for the sport or do <clears throat> all student athletes need to take PE in addition to sport team conditioning? I can answer that one also. If, if a student is doing sports conditioning and the, and the sport season is canceled, we will honor um, the sports conditioning with PE credit. Um, so I think, I think that answers that question. I mean, you're muted. Thank you, sorry. Um, we, we spoke about screening and testing. Can we say more about the testing plan, including what remains uncertain about testing? So for testing um, of employees, one of the requirements to submit the opening plan is to have a regular testing uh, schedule for employees. Um, the state requires, um, I believe it's every other month, which we're not quite sure um, what that actually solves is helping us uh, prevent spread. Um, the county requires a month and um, a lot of our neighboring districts um, are trying to aim for um, weekly. Um, we are trying right now to aim for once a month, which, would, uh, which we would have to be testing 250 employees Per week. Right now we do have um, testing available for employees who exhibit sy um, symptoms that are not able to go get tested for whatever reason from their current health provider, but a part of the reopening plan is to be able to test um, employees on a grander level. Um, another question is, if we opt for the distance learning, does that mean a substitute will be teaching the class? Will my son get to keep his same teachers for spring semester that he has now for all of his AP classes? The goal would be that he would keep, uh, that students would keep their same teachers. Um, again, the balance of um, how do we figure out um, to provide instruction to students that are at home in the class is the challenge. Um, but the goal will be that we keep students with their same teachers with the possibility that, again, we may have to um, alter some schedules to create um, a, an appropriate class size um, to have the, the right number of students in a physical classroom if, if need be. Um. There was info tonight on when the classrooms will be ready, January 2021, but there was not a mention of a goal of when we are trying to plan for return to campus for instruction. Is it just the classroom that is the goal for the January, or are you truly trying to get our students back in person for the high quality education they deserve? Um, the goal is to get as many students uh, back on campus as soon as possible and as safely as possible. And I'll add to that, that the room adjustments are continuous, um, that those will be ready by January, but they will be ongoing so that all the rooms will be able to accommodate at some point. And it's never been part of the plan to have all 2000 students back at once. 
<laughs> uh, that's just not uh, realistic um, for for the foreseeable foreseeable future. So it will definitely be a gradual uh, phase of uh, getting students back on campus. Um. What criteria was applied to permit the athletic cohorts, but not club or activity cohorts? I can speak a little to that. Um, with the uh, athletic cohorts, all of it was required to be outside. Um, they are still socially distanced. They are not sharing equipment. Um, while that provides some hurdles for those teams, um, a lot of the clubs and other activity cohorts that were requesting to come on would have required sharing equipment, being indoors, et cetera. And so it wasn't possible at that time. With the new co-curricular um, cohorts that um, we are able to start, um, again, they still will not be able to share equipment, but we will be able to have small cohorts in our doors and um, the ability to bring different groups together, clubs, et cetera. Uh, can you clarify stage three, what is a stable cohort? So a stable cohort um, allows for um, an, un I mean, I hate to say unlimited because obviously it couldn't be 2000, but I mean, potentially it could be 2000 if we were able to maintain six feet distance apart and people weren't interacting with each other. But the stable cohort allows us to expand um, the number of students that we have in each cohort. What I find um, as the most beneficial part of a stable cohort is that our students will be able to participate in more than one cohort. So if they require uh, connectivity and or academic or athletic or extracurricular, um, they are start, they're starting to participate in more um, than just um, one cohort as with the bubble model. Um, a common question coming up is, our plans for MA sound good? Will MA be able to um, held back if other SF, um, Sequoia Union High School District high school plans are not as far along? I must say that MA is performing like a rock star, but I expect no less. Um, no, MA um, will not be held back depending upon um, the other sites that we have within the school district. Um, the school district receives overall approval as a district. Um, and then once we start adding students um, in larger capacities back to campus, if a particular site were to have elevated cases based off of percentage, um, excuse me, of positive cases, then they would have to close down. If we have too many, then the entire district would have to close down. And I'll just clarify too that MA won't be moving ahead um, to bring people back without the appropriate labor negotiations and pieces in place that we've been working very, very collaboratively with our uh, teachers union, which is why we have interest in teacher proposed cohorts um, for co-curriculars. Um, and so that's our first gradual step. So I just wanna clarify that um, those pieces all need to be in place for MA to move forward to any instructional model that would bring students back to campus. Um, the pieces to layer in cohorts, right? Those are, those do vary site by site, right? Depending on the needs of the student population and depending on um, the things that we need to be doing. So I just wanted to clarify that, that as well. Once we are open and up and running, then absolutely yes, the case, uh, you know, it could be up to an ind uh, individual school site to transition fully back to distance learning depending on the percentage of cases. The number one priority is preserving our instructional program and keeping our staff and our students safe. And those are gonna be our guiding principles as we phase back in. Um, and I will be the first to say that I don't know who thought January the heavens were gonna open up and we could all be back at school. Um, we're clearly not seeing that right now, but that does not mean we're doing everything we can to be prepared and ready for when that time comes.
You're muted, Mr. Emmy. We're at, it. I think we're at I think we, I was going to say, I think we have about time. And I think we have I'll a, I'll ask question, one. a live question that was going to be answered, possibly. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Which one are we asking? <laughs> Can I just respond to one real quick? Yes, go for it. Uh, only because it, it just seems of, of uh, practical need. Uh, there's a question on there about sports conditioning and if a, um, if a sport is not running conditioning, will the, um, uh, how will that student get PE credit? And I would just recommend that that family or those families reach out to their guidance counselor and to me so we can start to problem solve that and, and resolve that issue. Uh, so that's all. I just wanted to say that that is something we need to start um, planning for. Um, and I would say reach out to your guidance counselor and, and as well as myself uh, via email. Do you, uh, do you say, Trustee Weiner, are you going to answer your live uh, no, question? I just, I just wanted to say, uh, I just want to express my appreciation to, um, to Simone and to the entire leadership team um, at MA. Um, I mean, as we see from the conversation tonight, um, there, you know, uh, this is, a, it's a three ring circus to kind of deal with all of the challenges uh, associated. Um, it's the case that this team is, I think, rising to the occasion and is um, moving forward with executing the commitment uh, that you heard from the superintendent and that has been shared by the board as well, which is to be able to bring uh, as many students as we can back to campus, uh, provided that we can do so in a way that's safe uh, for our um, students and our staff. And I'm, I'm, I'm just proud of the work that the team is doing to make that happen. And for Krieger, of course, the question is, it depends on whether it's a European or an African swallow. On that note, I thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we will post the slides and a recording of this webinar on our website. Um, and we also, you know, uh, will take note of the questions that we didn't get to. I think we tried to theme the questions and respond to all of them so that we can follow up. Um, and you can always reach out to me or any one of us and we're happy to answer your questions. So thank you this evening. Uh, thanks to our board members, uh, intern Superintendent Leach and my wonderful admin team and uh, Paul Snow. Um, much thanks to Lily Quinones. She is the heart and soul of our parent coordinator program uh, for translating this evening. To Noemi Menhivar, my amazing uh, administrative assistant. And to Ofa Talmani, who is uh, our amazing administrative vice principal assistant for setting up uh, the web webinar. So have a great evening, everybody. I wish you a wonderful Thanksgiving next week. <laughs>